Yes, so once again, welcome everyone to our second session for today, Africans Living Fully's webinar series on the guide to the future of work and global transition. This second session is focused this second session is focused on emerging careers in the development sector and how to carve a niche for yourself. And Fadila, if you can please introduce our main speaker for our second session today, so we can continue the momentum that we have had from our first session focused on social entrepreneurship. Thank you so much, Mari. Uh, thank you all for joining in today. So our second speaker for this session, or no, our first speaker, for the second session of today's webinar series on the guide to the future of work is Mr. Ebenezer S. Silfi Inyami, who is currently working with the Food and Agricultural Organization right here in Accra, Ghana. He's previously worked with the United Nations Information Center also here in Accra, Ghana. He continues to serve as a member and as a consultant for several youth-led organizations around the world, including Giovanni Almendo Association in Rome, Italy, Nigeria, organizations working in the environmental sustainability space here in Ghana, among other organizations. Mr. Ebenezer, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing and are you? Yes, thank you so much, Fadila, for the introduction. Um, I think with this kind of introduction, I don't even know how to, um, you, just, you just lost me. I'm wondering how you got all that information, but um, First of all, I would like to um, thank you all for putting this together and um, also greetings to anyone, all the participants who are also on board and uh, we're here to share our views and um, discuss these this issues together. Usually, um, as Fadila know, uh, I'm someone who always uh, would love to stay in my one corner, you know, because um, Usually, when when we have sessions, um, you know, speaking sessions like this, and then you ask me to speak, uh, the first thing that I, I get to think about is the motivational speakers who starts by saying, "Oh, ah, I I got my PhD at the age of seven. At the age of six years, right. I had I owned my first Lamborghini." So <laughs> with these kind of things, you know, since I I don't fall in that category, I always try as much as possible to avoid you know, such speaking opportunities. But anyways, I mean, um, we're here to share. So um, I'm happy to be, be here and then also to share my experience with you. And it's going to be um, a discussion session, which will be very vital for us. Thank you so much, Fadila. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ebenezer. Can we begin by you sharing your journey on how you found yourself working in the developmental space and why that has become such an important and significant aspect of your life? Yes, thank you so much. Um, that's that's quite a very difficult uh, difficult question. You know, it's easy as it is because it's just about recounting my life of how I have lived. I mean, up to this level, but it's also quite very difficult because um, then it means that I have to think through and then take like what <laughs> if I start talking about all these things, it's going to take me from from Ghana to Canada, from Canada to US, maybe to yeah, and then back to Ghana. So. I will just cut it short here. Um, I think my it's all about interest on exactly what you want to do. And um, so um, I had that interest to uh, to work in the development sector. And um, so from there, I worked towards it. And then that's how come I found myself into it. You've mentioned where, I mean, how or the organizations that I've, I've gone into. I started right from, from let's say, after Cedia High School started engaging in these activities because that was my interest. And in the university as well, I engaged myself in a lot of this. So most of these things that I'm doing, I started back in the university. And then um, also tapping into opportunities that, that came right after university. And then that's where I, that's, and that's how come I find myself in, in this development sector. I, I think that's a summary. Of, of what you've mentioned <laughs> all of the places that I've, I've worked so yes actually some of the places i haven't mentioned all of the places but it's interesting uh, your story 
uh, I believe it's quite unique, uh, but in some way also it is something that is easily accessible, but people do not believe that it is accessible to them. So, so for somebody who is just listening to this, perhaps they're in the university or perhaps they have actually, they are no longer in the university, but they're looking to start working in this particular sector. Where would you say would be the starting point? And in, in specific or with specific uh, focus on how the importance or what is the importance of building a portfolio and working pro bono can do for your ability to work in the digital space? Yes, um, that's, that's a very good question and it's interesting as well how to get into it. Um, if, if I sit here and say that, you know, most people say that it's very difficult to get into, you know, most of these international organizations, you know, the United Nations, the Red Cross, international NGOs. Sometimes when we talk about the development sector, we tend to forget the NGOs as well, but they play a very critical role when it comes to the development, the development sector. So international NGOs or even local NGOs, which are creating a lot of impact. So is it difficult to get it get into it in the first place? Of course it is, you know. That one I wouldn't lie to you. And the reason why it is very difficult to get into it is it's just one simple thing. When we ask uh, people who aspire, when I when I use we, I'm talking about the youth and everybody who has interest to work in the internet with these international organizations. When we we have the interest to work in these organizations, we look at the broader aspect instead of being specific. So for instance, you ask somebody, ah, what would you want to do? I mean, what career, what's your career path? I want to be an international diplomat. Well, that's, that's too right. broad. When you say international <laughs> diplomat, what do you mean? Okay, I want to work with the United right. Nations. That is too broad. What exactly do you want to do? So then, because right. it's too broad, we find ourselves, we tend to do programs that we, Mm -hmm. That would not lead us to the particular um, uh, career path that ah. we want to do. So we do broad things like we do international relations, and people think that when we do internet, when when someone does international relations, that is going to lead them to work with these international organizations. International relations is a right. very very broad field, which everybody could mm -hmm. do in regardless of whichever career path that you choose. So for me, for instance, I do not have any background. I mean, if I say back, educational background in international relations, I read environmental science, but I find myself working in the United Nations. I've worked with the United Nations Information Center, which does more of communication. It doesn't relate to my courses. Now, I've worked with the United Nations Mission for Ebola Emergency Response during the Ebola time. Um, doesn't relate to anything to my environmental science that I read in school. I'm currently working with FAO. I've worked with UNHCR previously, but it, so it, the, the simple thing that you think about is you have to look more into specific and exactly what you would, you would need to do. So, um, right. You, I don't know if um, they, to link it to your pro bono, I think you mentioned something about working as, Mm -hmm. I, if I, go I, I actually, yeah. I actually, I actually uh, love the perspective from which you come from starting this conversation because a lot of people feel like you need to study international relations for you to work with international organizations. And I have seen firsthand. I think uh, at some point in my in my career, I actually thought I wanted to work with the United Nations, but later on, I found out that I don't actually want to work with the United Nations. Uh, directly, but I will continue to work with the United Nations in supporting the sustainable development agenda and in creating equal opportunities for young people. So I love that you shared that. And uh, I think it, I will also add that it is important to note that for you to be able to work or for you to work in the developmental space does not necessarily mean you have to work with international organizations. You can start working with the NGOs, you can create your own project and start working with the different agencies that exist as a social entrepreneur. But more specifically, since we're talking about the developmental space and being a developmental profession, that means you are employed by one of these organizations. So my question was in respect to the activities that you had done that didn't actually pay you, but led to the experience, led to your ability to position yourself when you got the opportunity to start working with Unique. Exactly. So, and how yes. that is 
Exactly, exactly. So yeah, so that that was where I was coming. In, I, I was coming to. So um, for me personally, I look you look uh, specifically to um to what exactly you would want to do. So I realized at a very early stage that the United Nations is broad, and I had the same, I mean, um, thought as everybody initially. I'm working with the United Nations, so I'm going to use the United Nations as an example or whichever international organization that anybody has in mind as well. And uh, sitting here in Ghana, coming from somewhere very deep, um, you would think that, okay, and I actually thought that the United Nations is somewhere in New York. They didn't even know that it had different agencies right. and anybody. And I, I quite remember some time um, in my third year in the university, we came to Accra, I was in Cape Coast, and then we passed the UND people, and I'm like, wow, this building is like, it's secluded, you, because you can't see inside, the whole wall is, you can't see anything inside, wow, this is a very difficult place to get in. So I started researching, and I realized that in, the United, in, in whichever international organization or which um, development sector that you want to go into, it's just the structures, simple, we have the technical aspect, we have operations and right. programs, we have administration and yeah. finance, and then we have communications. So if you build your portfolio, you build yourself in any of these four main broad areas, it means that you can find anything to do. When I say technical, for instance, if you want to work with uh, UNDP, or maybe, okay, let me use World Health Organization. Now the World, World Health Organization, so now there is this global crisis, COVID-19. So the World Health Organization is the leading UN agency that is taking care of this. We have the technical people who are the medical doctors, who are the scientific researchers, those who research into, into, into these things. We have um, so a lot when we come to the technical aspect. So these are the technical people. So it's either you improve your skills in that particular aspect. If it is UNDP, UNDP does a whole lot of things in terms of development, international development, or local development, or um, uh, maybe water and sanitation. So these are specific technical, so you can build yourself in those particular aspects. The other aspects which people don't look at are the operations and programs. So um, operation is like the engine of the organization. If we say UNDP, we are not only looking at the people that think technical people who are implementing the activities but how are they going to draw work plans how are they going to i mean write concept notes on the outputs and then the um, you know outcomes and all that so the operations how how are they going to draw budget these are things that they need so then people who who have experience or who have a background in operations and programs are needed there now, administration and finance, you need people who put together the office very well. So um, as, as an administrative office, so you would need you know, basic administration, like um, receiving and then se um, receiving and sending out uh, you know, um, letters and stuff, fixing the office in terms of finding what exactly you need you know, in the office and all that. Finance is also one thing, administration and finance usually are together. So someone who, did uh, a bachelor of commerce or someone who, who read anything related to finance can also find himself working in the same UNDP and then communications. These technical people are so deep into technical that when they, ca when, when they, when they are talking, it's so, so um, technical ways that they use, but you need someone who would, who have an expert in communication to, you know, link whatever they are doing to, um, to what the public would understand. So someone who did communications would also find himself in there. So you see how broad it is. So you choose whichever aspect that you think you are interested in and you have the capabilities in, and then there you can easily go in there. And pro bono itself. Now, as, as I was saying, I started as a volunteer, as, as volunteering. And when I was doing this volunteering, it wasn't necessarily because I would want to work with the UN or I would want to work with an international organization. The reason why I was doing that was one, what benefits whatever I was doing have with the community right. that I'm going to work, I'm going to make, um, make that impact. 
and it also benefit to myself as well. So benefit to community, benefit to myself. So without this, then whatever you are doing is not. So benefit to community if, so I remember back then in, 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 I was in my third year in the university and then during that time we had the Ivorian conflict um, in, in Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire. Wow. We had a, a lot of refugees who were flowing into Ghana and the government right. of Ghana set up mm -hmm. refugee camps. And one of the camps that was set up was close to where my university was. It was like 20 minutes drive, 20 right. 30 minutes mm -hmm. drive away from my university. So I was like, okay, these people are French. Some of them were in school. When you listen to their stories, they were in school, right. final year in the university, and the war broke. Now the war is ongoing. They don't even know whether they are going to complete their education. Their dreams are shattered. And now right. they, how are they going to integrate? How are they going to move on with their life? So I just decided, okay, which, uh, how can we help with these people? And with a friend, we decided to approach the UNHCR, which was the um, uh, uh, UN agency that was responsible for helping that. We approached them, sent them a proposal and told them that, you know what, we would want to help you with the um, uh, publicity aspects, you know, when it comes to refugee matters. We are in the university, we can do sharing, we can share ideas, or we can share our experience. These are French people, we can teach them English, they can teach us French anyway. So English is very important for them, for them to integrate, it, for them to integrate into the society. So we can, we can help by teaching them English. We can also wow. help them by those who were already in school and reading similar courses. So there were people in the school who were reading French, or mm -hmm. yeah, just like in Ghana, people read English as a course in the university, people were reading French. Now, we have a French uh, department in the university. These people, how can they tap into these opportunities and continue with their lives? So then we did that and the UNACR accepted it wholly. We started as Friends of UNACR at the University of Cape Coast. It was mm -hmm. a boom. We were able to educate a lot of people in the university about refugee rights and how they can support we did a lot of things which the UNHCR was. And by doing that, you know, the opportunities just started coming in. Before I completed the university, the United Nations Information Center wanted me to do an, an internship with them. You know, this wow. was some this was not something that, you know, I I I I said maybe I'm right. just going Yes, exactly. But it just came my way because of what I was doing. They realized that okay, my skills and what I'm doing would be very beneficial to they are working and all that. And that's how come I got into it. So so it did, it differs on everybody. Um, but right. that this is how I got into whichever sector that I'm, I'm in now. But I didn't have the mindset of working there. Right. I was right. making that and the opportunities came and then I, I tapped into it. So yeah. This is beautiful that you shared, uh, because it also shows two perspectives. That who has the utmost desire to work there and that who, whose desire was to make an impact at whatever stage or, or place they saw. So you came from a place of value. That means for everybody listening to this conversation, if you're looking to work in the developmental space, you need to come from that place of service. You need to proactively seek for opportunities to serve, whether it is in international organizations or in your local community, and do so genuinely, do so inclusively. And as you're doing so, opportunities are going to come your way. If they don't come your way, go knocking to look for those opportunities. Share. He, he, he had to approach the UNHCR with a proposal. So you cannot be sitting and be saying, oh, I'm doing NGO work or I'm doing this particular project and nobody has heard about what you're doing. Take the initiative. Go and ask. Know what you want. Go and ask for what you want and do it wholeheartedly and you never really know what opportunities can come from that. So let's move on to uh, the issue of uh, the future of work. In this space, the developmental space, what would you say are the key skills and principles of which people who are aspiring or are currently working in this space need to do in order to adapt to the changes that are happening within the space? And can you talk to us briefly about some of the changes that you are noticing or that you are anticipating to happen in the space? Well, I, I would even say that this, um, in, in, um, if, if you're looking at the changes that is happening, this is something that had al always been preached about, you know, even before this particular situation, the COVID situation that we are in now, because um, 
most of these donor agencies and um, right. they are like Father Christmas that they have a lot of money to give away, but right. they 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 always looking for it's it's quite very simple. It's um they are looking for the most effective for the least cost, most mm. effective for the least cost. There are so when we we present uh, you know work plans, we tell them this is what we really want to do. How can you make it? at a very least cost but being effective to it so um this is something that had al always been playing in the mind and if you realize in the if you you've heard in the united nations itself has been cutting its budget you know countries right. have been cutting their do donations and all that because it's a very difficult time but mm -hmm. the thing also is that you know people keep uh, countries keep putting in money because for instance, a problem anywhere is a problem in one place is a problem anywhere. So if we have Ebola and then countries don't put in money to stop Ebola at where it started from, it will spread. And then right. the amount of money that they would need to take care of it is quite difficult. A typical example is the situation that we are finding ourselves in now. So if we had known, if people, if countries had known earlier where the source is coming from, they would have put in a lot of resources to finish it at where it is so that it doesn't spread. Because when it spread, it's, it's, you know, it becomes, it's the same thing. If hunger is in Africa, if poverty is in Africa, there will be a lot of people who, immigrant problem in Africa, so people keep, right. keep on putting their money. But the future currently, they are looking, uh, that most company organizations are looking into uh, because of this um, they look into technology number one number two right. how to make uh, a cultural integration of it and um, also the most important thing that these organizations look at is how to quantify the impact that they are looking at so right. and when we talk about the future of work it's not just the work itself but also the workforce and then the yeah. workplace so yeah. uh, the work is one how do you get the impact that you want the workforce the people to achieve you to achieve i mean the human resource in order to achieve the objective that you are setting for and then the workplace how are you going to do it so this when you look at these three things then you could you could look at the transitions in all the aspects so currently for workforce we are having a very it's more competitive and we're right. having a lot of diversity in talent and capacity right um, the, the solutions are also becoming very, very effective. I'll give you a typical example. So um, for, we have a wildlife uh, game here in Ghana. It could be anywhere. So it's a very, very big, several acres of land, and we have some wild animals in it. How does the park, yeah. how is the park able to monitor these, um, the, the wildlife species that are in, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. someone will just sit down and say, okay, when we go for tourism, uh, they are open for tourism as well. So when we go for tourist visit, and I, right. I tell them, oh, I want to see a lion. It's because of a lion that I came here. How can they take me to where lions are? Bear in mind that animals don't have any boundaries. They can move anywhere depending on whatever they want. <laughs> How are you able to track them? So then someone sits down and say, okay, I will develop a tool that would be able to track all the animals. No matter what time you want, you'll be able to find wherever the lion population is. That is where, as a technological pro process, so the person has been able to bridge a gap. And this person would, would be highly hired by that wildlife department or whatever, because then the person has a solution that they want. So then they will work with this person in order to develop it because it improves whatever they are doing. Now, coaches, uh, you 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 realize that in the United Nations, for instance, each and every year we have this YPP, the Young Professionals Program, and they list countries right. that are eligible to apply. It's because most of these countries do not have a lot of people serving in the United Nations. And then the other aspect, which which is obvious, is that most donor countries would pre uh, would would actually propose the P uh, the countries that they want to use their money to, to recruit into the United Nations. So that's the across cultures, everybody. So you, you check a uh, job description and say, okay, we want someone who speaks Spanish. They are targeting because yeah. you're going mm -hmm. to work in a Spanish, maybe Southern America, you need Spanish.
to be able to communicate effectively. You need Spaniards to be able so how to bridge the cultures is also one thing that we are looking at. And then the impact, how to quantify the impact. So whatever idea that you're having, if you're a technical person, and then um, maybe the organization wants to do a particular project, how would you be able to quantify the impact to tell the donor that, okay, you gave me 50,000, this is what I have for the 50,000. You can see it, you can tell them, they can see the change, they can feel it, and then say, wow, okay, my money is being used right, so I'm going to put in much. So that's the future of the work. So then the talents that you are developing is one thing, and we're also looking at experience. Um, I remember there's this um, old man, he was very good. He wasn't that old after six, you know, 60 years retirement, so he retired. And after he retired, within just a month, he died. It's because this person, this person is like used to always moving from his house, going to the office, working and all that. So once that kind of atmosphere is no longer there, the person is depressed and then the person goes away. So um, in the United Nations, for instance, we have a lot of older population in there. So mm -hmm. this older population, they come out with, they, they have a lot of experience. I mean, a lot of experience. Right. And that, that does not impede the the uh, recruitment of the young people. As I told you, there is this young professionals program every year recruiting young people into the United Nations. So the diversity in talent and in, in capacity is is also something that is affecting the future. I mean, of, of work. And then also the last thing, the workplace. As I said, I mean, currently you can we have co-working locations. If you don't have an office. There is someone who will open a very big office and say, okay, five different companies can work in here. That is the that they are going. And then people are also working from home as we are doing now because of this COVID-19. So it's also affecting the future of work. Wow. This is a lot for everyone to be able to digest, but I love the fact that you shared such a holistic view of the different elements uh, that are being affected. Now the question comes, what key principles and skills should people who want to work within this space possess to be able to adapt to these changes that are happening? And a follow-up question to that, uh, just to ensure that we are within time, is we know that there's a fierce competition. This question comes from one of our participants and she said, how can you break the fierce competition in getting into the international developmental space? Okay, so um, which one would you want me to answer okay. first? Skills and principles, and then the competition. Yes. So as as I as I said, the skills is is I gave you the structures that you can tap into. So the skills is like open, depending on whichever um, which whichever which which part of the structure that you would want you would want to get into. Um, <clears throat> sorry. There's this um, uh, one of the American presidents, Abraham Lincoln. He he once mentioned that give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I'll spend the first four sharpening the axe. You know, the axe is what you use to chop down the tree. And if you have an axe that is not sharpening, you can't chop. You take even more than the hours that you need to chop down the tree. So he will use the four hours to sharpen to sharpen the axe. So the axe become very sharp. Mm -hmm. You, you strike it down. As in, in relation to what we are talking about, is to build yourself a lot. So, um, um, so if, for instance, you Subject. want to be a finance expert in an international organization, as I said, it's still, it's, 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 the international development is very broad and depending on where you want to is where you build yourself to get into. So if you read okay. finance, because of your interest in reading business in school, but you have also an interest to make an impact in the development sector. It's a very good skills match. You develop yourself, build yourself as a finance guru. You, mm -hmm. you, get, into the, you get into the UN and then do what you, you really wanted to do. It's not all about, you know, people think about if I'm working in the UN, then I have to, it's like what we see on TV. Um, we travel using UN flights, going to the communities, meeting people, making the changes and all that. Those are just like 
five percent of of what of what the international organizations do. The actual work is how the planning goes and everything. So that one minute clip that you see of the impact that is is being made, sometimes we take almost six months to work on it. And this six months has been worked on by a whole array of people, finance experts, uh, operations, the technical people. These are all the, the communications, how the whole thing should go. And these are all the, so if you really want to get into, into ways, I link it with the question that, that is coming in from, from TYS is how can one break through the fierce competition in getting into the, exactly. So you just have to build yourself in whichever, if it is um, human rights that you are in, you build yourself in that particular aspect. And then sometimes opportunities come knocking. You, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know, you know, but the whole idea of, of you have the mindset that you need to have is exactly what you want to do and the impact that you want to make. And then you would find one opportunity that links to your experience. My advice is that always be looking at this. If you, you want to work there, I mean, you look at the job descriptions, the announcements that comes in, just take it. Okay. You want to become a human rights expert in the United Nations. Go to the right. UN website, look for UN jobs on human rights experts. Look right. at the requirements or whatever they need and see whether your CV matches it. If your CV doesn't match it, you work towards it. If they say, okay, if you check, you've checked about 10 of them, they all need French. I'll build mm -hmm. my, I'll, I'll, I'm going to build myself in French. Yeah, I'm going, that's the only thing that you are lacking. I'm going to right. French. I'm going to learn. Because what they do is that when jobs are advertised, the process is quite very simple. We, mm. They look for matching skills. That's all, matching skills. Skills that match. That's the first, the first stage that will get you into the interview. So you will have over one million applications. People are applying for that same position. And it's difficult for people to sit down and lose. So look, they look for, for skill set. Okay, we want someone very well and what exactly they want to do. And if you're able to move through the first stage, then you know that once you are being called for interview, it means that you have an 80% chance of getting it. You may have 500 people shortlisted for interview. Or the, the shortlist of interview could just be like only 10 people. It means that you have like 80% chance of getting it because your skills matches exactly what they are looking for. And the interviews will ask you specific, more specific questions on the role that you would want to play. It's more, and when you're applying for these positions, people, one, one mistake that people make, and I think that I would have also made if I wasn't in the, if I didn't get into the system, you know, because when I was at UNIC, I was helping with the recruitment of interns and you realize, so I was put, first of all, put in the role of trying to recruit somebody. So then if I'm applying for something myself, I tend to think as an employer or what I had gone through when I was recruiting someone. And these are very, very simple techniques. You know, that you, if you write too long, nobody has, they'll just put it away. You just, we need A, B, C, D, E. Okay, I have A, B, C. The D I do not have, but I have something that links to the D. As I told you, I read environmental science. I'm working in FAO. I'm, I'm working, how does it link? They say they need someone who did business administration. I don't have. How does whatever I have done links? And that is where also, other, I've done other things that complements that. So instead of maybe doing a master's degree in uh, maybe public administration, I've had experience working in the field of administration that matches it. So they said they need someone with a master's in that business administration. However, if you have five years working experience on administration, so then no, I have myself there. Mm. You understand? So I don't meet that first requirement. They need someone this. I don't meet it. But I have someone, they, they give a leeway and I work towards the leeway and I get into it. So this, these are some of the techniques that you can use in, in getting to wherever. And meeting people. Sometimes most of these jobs are based on also recommendations. Right. Yes, the people that you meet. 
and if you meet people you know and you put you put up a very very good you know working attitude or how you work with them not necessarily meeting people it's just based on recommendation they recommend it to you so one yeah. at first people will say it's to who you know it's because they know that you can perform better it's not because they know you because um you are a friend to them or whatever because these days if you recommend somebody and a person that's awful your name is yeah. dented and you can't recommend anybody again so they will only recommend people that they know can do whatever um right when Job. you meet people right. you do very well in in whatever you want to do uh, you are supposed to do you create the contacts and then they'll call you one one day or the other to to make to tell you oh, there's this opportunity if you are interested and that doesn't mean you get it. So to who you know, you've met somebody, they recommend you. The other thing is what you know, because the person is not going to interview you. There are different panels who are good. The person has done the first bit of introducing you. Now you have to do your best in getting that particular. So if you go and you fail, you don't do well, you don't get it. So that's also another aspect of, of the whole thing. It is a marathon and not a race. That is the euphoria that I get from this. And I think you have represented that throughout your career journey. You continue to upskill because uh, you're also looking to grow in the career. Madeline, do we have any more questions for Ebenezer? It looks like... I might... Hi. We, it looks like we have another question in the chat box. From Damiola. And her question is What kind of activities can be done to show personal development and skills? How can these achievements be brought to the line of sight of these organizations? Okay, yes, that's, that's a very good question. Thank you, Damiola. Um, so, personal development or skills, as the name implies, how, how do you develop your personal skills or set? So, um and this one i think when i give practical examples it's quite easy and um, i know myself a bit so yeah. i'll use i'll use myself as an example so personal development for instance back then i told i just told you that i i got the offer from the un information center to work as an intern immediately even before i completed university okay right. so now it's an information center how does my personal development, it was based on a recommendation, I had to send in my CV, I had to still follow the same, those, though they wanted me, I had to still write an application and all these things. How does my skills relate to what they do? Back in school, in the second year, I, I read broadcast journalism. You know, mm -hmm. I, I just felt that radio was an important tool to make an impact. So doing broadcast journalism, and then also I was, I was, I was working with the um, radio station there. So I, I had a bit of journalism. That's a development, that's a skills development. I was reading environmental science, but I developed myself in public speaking. I developed myself in communication. I developed myself in radio and um, you know, journalism itself without necessarily being in the classroom. Although, I mean, doing a broadcast journalism course, we have the, um, the theory aspect and then the, I, I did theory, but if I said I didn't go to school, meaning that it wasn't a bachelor's degree or it wasn't like a diploma or anything, but right. it was like an experience. So I developed my skills right there. Back in school also, I, I was doing a lot of publicity. In, the, in school, I was the press and information secretary for the SRC, and um, SRC is the Student Representative Council. But yeah. when I was in my third year, I was a press and information secretary, managing the whole press. So when I sent my CV, obviously, even though I'm reading environmental science, but whatever skills that I have relate to that. So I would rather mention all those skills, highlight those skills, rather than highlighting pro, uh, things that does not matter to the organization that I'm working, I'm working for. You see, in, in the other aspect, also, um, if, if it comes to business, because I, I had done I, I had done something also working with business back in school, I I, I did marketing with uh, Tigo, um, it's right. a telecommunication company. 
in Ghana. So I had done that as well. It's developed my skills, but not because I want to develop my skills as a, or, or like I'm learning everything just for learning sake, but I know exactly what I want. As I said, I had created, okay, these are the structures. This is what right. I would need to get into whatever I want into. So I started getting what I need. I needed marketing. So I worked with a telecommunication company, learned the basis of marketing, going to the field. I saw SIM cards. My mom doesn't know this, but I did all I did. I, I sold SIM cards, going there. How do you, how do you uh, sell a product to someone who, who basically, you know, <laughs> yeah. So these are the things that I learned for my own self. And, and these are some of the personal developments and then you can use it. You say, how can these achievements be brought to the line of sight exactly? It's not about bringing it to the sight of them. It's about reading what exactly they want and then you working towards. So if I'm applying for work in the UN, if, um, sorry, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, I'm not going to list I work for a marketing company like Tigo because they don't right. need it. What does that, <laughs> how does that, they don't need it. They don't right. need it. Rather, I'll use something probably I work for, I worked as an operations manager for a baby mom foundation. Yes. Oh, wow, yes. Okay, operations, exactly. We need that. Uh, yeah. What, so what can you do? Are you good at doing budget and all that? Yes, I do. I've done this, I've done that. This is an example of what I've done. And then I get into it. So exactly, that's, that's, what, I, that's, that's what you do. You prepare yourself based on what you want. So look exactly where you want to be look at their requirements and look at what exactly they need. And then mm -hmm. you prepare yourself towards that. When you do that, that's, that's what, so personal development should be in relation to where you would want to be. Fantastic. And this applies not only for those who are just starting out, but also those who want to transition. Uh, a brief question. In your experience, and I know that you, not only the work that you do, but through the work that you do, you've also met a number of people in this space. How easy would you say it is, uh, particularly for people from developing countries, whose experience is not in the developmental space to transition into, the, uh, into developmental work with international organizations? And what did they need to do for them to be able to get those opportunities? Yes. So as as I said, <clears throat> as I said, um, if 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 probably you you could give a very typical example, then I would know where to address it because um, okay. for me, let's give an example. Uh, somebody who worked at uh, let's even say a bank or an insurance company as the treasury, perhaps, or someone who worked in an oil and gas company uh, as a let's say I don't know as a technical advisor on drilling or something of that nature, and now they want to work with one of the organizations or one of the agencies within the UN, or not even necessarily within the UN, but bigger foundations that exist out there that are in a similar space. Have you seen a number of people transition or is the majority of the people that you have seen typically like started out there and then they grew within a career? Because that's a question I get a lot about yeah, uh, yeah yeah yes just just exactly so it's 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 it, it just falls in line with what I, I i have been saying so someone who is working in the oil sector or uh, yeah so somebody has that uh, is the uh, manager for oil i'll give you a typical example of friends who we all read environmental science together but currently they are general managers of banks so uh, yeah just think about it. So um, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Now, it's all about preparing yourself to meet whatever you need. So I'm working in the oil sector. In the oil sector, it's very broad. There's, there are people who are handling their tools and equipment and all that. Now, the person would want to become um, maybe a technic, uh, how, how do you how do you call them? There's this UN UN operations um, uh, operations agency, UNOPS, right? So over there we have people who have a, who are who are electrical engineers. We have people who are mechanical engineers. We have people who are so it's about finding the right UN agency. If if it's UN, that is it. If you're looking at um, maybe other international organizations, you could, I mean, the Red Cross, you can talk about the NGOs as well, um, Oxfam and all those ones. Just look at 
all their house. So the first thing that you do when you want to transition, go to whichever organization that you want to you, you would want to transition into or whichever field of in the development sector because it's very broad. You go to whichever field in the development sector that you would want to work in, look at their objectives first and whatever they want to do. I'm sure you might know. And then the second thing to do to do is to look at their um how do you call it the staff structure so over there you will find all the all the staff they list all the positions that are there mm -hmm. it's very very easy so then you look at all the positions which of them am i interested in and which of them matches my skills so it's if you don't have those skills you work to get those skills if you get those skills and then you get you get into it there is someone who was working in the bank as a as an inv investment advisor, yeah. finance finance investment advisor, the best credit advisor. Sorry, credit like so. He advises he is going to advise a bank on how to give out credit and all that. Now right. the person got an opportunity to work in a development sector and the person the, the person got the portfolio of an investment advisor so it's a development organization they would be giving out money on a particular project we need someone to advise them so the, the person transitions from working in the bank the person is working but with the same skills so as a credit advisor credit is the same thing giving out loans and all that now i mean the development sector they would want to give all this. So then you can see that the skills matches wherever they are, and then yeah. the person goes to it. It's the same thing. Sometimes you don't need to even bother yourself changing field or your right. skills. You don't need to bother. Just look at, go to their positions, check all these things, see which one matches whatever you have currently, and see if you have to build upon it. If you build on it, you get it. Um, more recently, in 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 that field, they've been recruiting human resource. Of, uh, yeah, I, I didn't mention human resource as well. So someone goes to someone is working in a bank as a human resource officer. Mm -hmm. In the in the NGO, so they have to recruit. So definitely, they will need a human resource officer. So it's almost the same thing. It's almost the same thing. Just that there are a lot of people who are human resource officers who would also want to work in that particular development sector that you want to go into. So what makes you different? How can you be different mm. in, in, in that? So that, that, that leads us to that personal development question that uh, Damilola asked. Wow, this has been very insightful. Uh, Madi, do we have any more questions for Mr. Ebeniza? My question is, how do we connect with Ms. Mr. Ebenezer and how can we follow his journey and the work that he's been doing? <laughs> I love that question. So what we're going to do is, I'm just going to type in the chat box uh, for everyone uh, that, that handles LinkedIn and Instagram before the end of this session uh, of all the speakers so we can stay connected. In the absence of any more questions, Mr. Ebenezer, I would like to thank you profoundly for taking out your time to share your journey to share the insight, to share the practical and pragmatic approach on how one can be able to build a career in the developmental sector and continue to grow. You have indeed demonstrated not just experience and expertise, but also practical and pragmatic approach and the need for taking personal responsibility in carving a path that is true to one, wherever it is that they are in. Do we have any parting words before we begin the next session, please? I have some parting words for Dila. I just want to... Yes, I'm so oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll... Either of you can... Okay, I will go if you don't mind, Mr. Ebenezer, and then you can close it off so we can save the best for last. So I just want to say thank you to our speaker for today. In the beginning of our session, he actually opened up and said that he usually tries to avoid speaking in these kinds of yeah. sessions because he thinks of these kind of motivational speakers who have these fancy cars and they start yelling about their Lamborghinis and all their money and for me personally and I'm sure for many people in this session today a lot of us don't relate to that and those messages can just go in one ear and out the other and so for me what I truly appreciate about you is your uh, our our ability to to uh, relate with you 
and, and your ability to lay out the exact steps that we need to take. And you made, you made a strategy for something so far reaching and maybe like a big dream of working for an international organization uh, accessible for all of us. So thank you so much for accepting this opportunity to speak. We're so happy you did not avoid having this platform to share and I'm excited to hear more about your work and hope that you can continue to use your voice and impact other youth uh, around the world. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Madeline, and then uh, Fatih also for this opportunity. Um, what last thing that I would want to say is um, to everybody, um, the, the last thing that would get you to wherever is um, discipline. Um, once someone, I can't remember exactly, but at, at, at the beginning of my you know, journey, someone mentioned something to me which always kept me going, that you need charisma to get to the top, but when you get to the top, it's you need discipline to stay at the top. And always it's something that you know lingers in my mind. You may have the skills, you may have everything that you need. You get mm. to the top, of course, you make a lot of um, impact, you do, you make a lot of money, do whatever you want. But in order to stay at the top and still be at the top, you would need discipline. And that is something that um, I would want to leave you with. Um, but also, Fadila, you know, yeah. upon all that you said, uh, one time this uh, guy went to, to, to the boss. Uh, he, he told the boss that three companies were, were after him and he needed a raise to stay at the job. Mm. So he and the boss were just hackling and then they decided to settle on a 5% raise, you know, in salary. And right. when he was in the office, the boss asked him, so, okay, so, yeah, I've given you the 5% raise in your salary, but, by the way, which companies are after you? And then the guy responded that the electricity company, the water company, and then the, which, which other one, the telephone company, they were after him. Actually, he was going them, so that's it. Well, that's just, that, that's just a joke for the way. Okay, I so. love this. <laughs> This is a great way to end our session. Thank you for not only bringing your professionalism, but bringing your human aspect and bringing your incredible sense of humor to this conversation. We couldn't have asked for a better guest. So we would like to say a very big thank you on behalf of myself and everybody at African Sleeve and Fully, Madi, our lead support team member, our partner, Abu Rungi, all the way from South Africa, who are our media partners at 1,000 African Voices. Thank you for your time and we are grateful for the opportunity to share your story and we look forward to continuing to do this on a deeper level. So enjoy your evening and we will begin the next session in just about two minutes. So the next, thank you.